thank you and welcome to the S54 Committee of Conference, um, our second meeting. Um, and Graham Campbell is going to do a review of the, the tax and finances of S54. And he's ready. Thank you, Representative Gannon. Um, I stated for the record, my name is Graham Campbell. I work for the Joint Fiscal Office and I'm here to talk about the um, updated revenue estimates for uh, the House and Senate versions of S54. Revenues and the House version of the sales tax revenue. Um, I don't have a whole lot to say at this point about the, the fee revenue uh, because they haven't been established by the board. So um, these are mostly gonna be about the excise tax revenues in the bill. Before I, get, I dive into um, the estimates, um, Andrew, can you pull up the document just so the committee is looking at it or um, they can see? Can, can you email it as well so I can pull it up on my iPad? Um, Graham, I've made you co-host if you'd like to go through it. Um, is this the one that was sent out earlier? Yes, you all should have it on our yeah. committee page. Okay. okay. On the committee page, yes. And also, uh, I've only got one device that works, so I would like. Um, to... Okay, hold on. And there's probably a lot of people that don't have it, so if you could post it on the screen, it would be yeah. great for us. I just like to scroll. Those of us with very few de <laughs> few devices that work outside. Um, Andrea, I'm on my iPad, and so I don't have it pulled up on my computer. So okay, I will share my screen. Thank you, Andrea. Perfect. And I'll just, we're gonna, I'll, I guess I'll let you know when we'll scroll, but um, is everyone in the committee sort of um, able to see and follow along as I go here? Yes, thank you. Yes. Okay. Um, so before I dive into the, the revenue estimates, um, when I started working on these, I realized that the, the revenue estimates that I had done for each um, versions of the bill um, were most likely outdated. I looked at my, my fiscal note for the Senate version of this bill, and it was done in February of 2019. So what you're going to be seeing here are um, updates to um, the revenue estimates for both bills because the information used in the revenue estimates for the fiscal notes that were produced at the time that these passed um, was, is no longer um, up to date. So um, these revenue estimates are updated with new information. <clears throat> Primary, the, the biggest updates um, include um, new information on per capita consumption for, um, for cannabis. Um, there was a, a report um, done by a, a firm called Vincent Sa Vicente Saderberg, um, which looked at Vermont's cannabis market and, um, and estimated a, a much higher per capita consumption rate than what we've been using in the model. So we, we, um, we thought the report was useful and we added that to our model to, um, to which drove our consumption um, number a little bit higher. We also had updated revenue from Massachusetts. So Massachusetts at the time had done this for the, the house, um, had just done its first year of cannabis. So they started in November, 2018. And so we had a year of, uh, of full information, but we have, um, several more months of information of a, that will show that show Massachusetts markets um, maturing quite a bit, although it's a little bit skewed because of COVID. I mean, the months of April and May in Massachusetts were just zero sales. So um, the numbers are a little bit off, uh, off for a typical year two, but they show a, a maturing market as one would expect. Um, we updated the usage rates so every year. The National Survey on Drug Use and Health uh, puts out a survey on, um, on uh, cannabis usage in the state, which showed that in 2018, um, modestly higher, um, higher percentage of uh, individuals had used cannabis in the past month than the previous year. Um, and then we up updated prices um, for cannabis across the middle states. So. Um, those are the, the main drivers. And I, I think the, the key um, uh, results of these updates are that the, the estimates are a little bit higher than they were um, as of March 
um, 2020 when I did, when I did that the house estimates, and they're a little bit higher than um, back in February of 2019 when I did the Senate estimates. So, um, but I should emphasize that the timing of how this market will get set up is is critical to how much revenue will come in, um, and so uh, our the estimates in this model assume that retail sales and the house version will begin um, in July of 2022 for those medical dispensaries that have applied and been accepted for those integrated licenses in November 2022 for all other retail establishments. Um, and then the Senate version, because they didn't have that integrated license at the beginning, um, was just November 2022. Um, and so that's a, that's a pushback of the timeline of about six months, even though um, the difference between what I estimated for the, when the house bill passed and, and sort of when it could potentially pass now is about four months. Um, we, we thought that generally the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic um, might slow things down even further. So that just um, gives you a sense of when we think the first, um, sales will start happening and that's reflected in some of the estimates. So I guess before I go to some of the numbers, are there any questions on, on this portion um, of the work? No. Okay, um, Andrew, can you scroll to the next page? So um, this summarizes the, the, the revenue estimates for the house version of S54 and so uh, the way these tables for both uh, versions of the bill are sort of ordered is you'll see the top is the number of taxable sales per year. That gives you a sense of what the, the market is. And I always put that in these revenue estimates because in the event that um, the committees want to just change the rate um, by a, a percentage point or two, they can easily just find out what revenue will raise by multiplying the rates times that taxable base there at the top. So um, what we see here in S54 is in fiscal 21 and 22, to um, we're looking at no revenue because the, re the market's not quite set up. Um, and then once the market gets sort of online in fiscal 23, the first couple months are really just the integrated licenses from the medical dispensaries. And uh, the later, I think it's um, eight months are full retail sales. Um, and then it matures into a fully mature market by fiscal year 24. Um, you can see in the red numbers at the bottom of each table what was estimated for um, back in February of 2020. So you can see the difference for fiscal year 22 for taxable sales is $1.3 million. And that's basically just the, the shifting of the, um, the medical dispensaries because in the, in, back in March, th there was a timeline that existed where they could plausibly get some sales in the back half of fiscal 22. We don't think that's possible anymore. So what those taxable sales translate is essentially the first table multiplied by 14%. Um, so you'll see that in fiscal year 21 and 22, we don't anticipate any revenue from the excise tax or the sales tax, which is the third table coming in. And really revenue starts to, um, starts to be generated in fiscal year 23. So the midpoint estimate for the house for a 14% excise tax is $4.4 million. Um, in fiscal 23, growing to 9.4 in fiscal 24 and 12.3 in fiscal 25. You can see in the red that it's modestly high. That number, those numbers you see in the table are modestly higher than what they were in February 2020. And then the third table, um, we estimate zero. Um, can you go back to the how to the to the the excise tax revenue? Yeah, so that's the second table um, on this sheet here. So we predict that zero revenue will be generated in fiscal year 21 and 22 because there'll be no retail sales. The, the market will still be getting set up. Am I confused by your terms? Because you got the sales was in the house was 6%, right? Mm -hmm. So how is that raising more than revenue at 14%? I don't understand. Sorry. So the second table is the revenue from 14%. And the third table is how much revenue is going to be raised in from the sales tax. Okay. So the 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 
Okay, so the 14 and the sales, that, that's the net? That's the, yeah. So if you want to know what the total revenue is for the, for the house bill, you would add the second table and the third table. So, okay, thank you. Yeah, so in total revenue for the house would be 4.4 .4 for the midpoint in fiscal 23, it would be $4.4 .4 million plus 1.9, so $6.4 million. This is all very confusing. Oh, I see. Four point four. I was looking at the. So, the the first table, in billions, goes between a low of forty eight four million and FY twenty four and ninety million, and then you broke it out in the various categories in the house bill. Is that correct? The first table is, is the taxable sales. So that's the like that's the market. That's the amount of sales done by the retail establishments. And the reason I put that in there is it just it, it allows for um, is there okay, I mean, go ahead. Yeah. Then. Is, is there a the, place where you have the total revenue in the house bill and the Senate bill? No. Yeah, uh, the, the total revenues for the house bill would be this would be not for the house bill, but for the Senate bill, yes. So the house bill. It's the sum of the of the second and third table. So, if you that's see, all. That is the number. Yeah, for the revenue, for the total revenue, for between both the excise and the sales tax revenue. But because they're split into two different funds, I put them into two separate tables. Well, actually, you have four different funds. Oh yeah, that's right. There's the there's the prevention fund and the in the general fund as well. So, wow. but the the first two tables there are. The, the sum, the sum of those two would be the total revenue. And I can send a table showing the, the total revenue to the committee, but it's- Yeah, I think that's what I'm most interested in under both versions, what's the total <laughs> revenue um, well, can, to the state. Can I jump in? Because if you're gonna show that, we should also, even though you don't have a figure for it, we should include the fees. Yeah. In the house version. Even though we don't know what they are, if, you, if you're going to have an all-in figure, it needs to at least note that the fees are going to be part of that. Right. Um, right. Okay. I can create a total, a total revenue table, but um, yeah, the, the total revenue, at least for the excise and the sales tax for the house bill, for the, for the midpoint estimate that we have here, for fiscal year 23 would be $6.3 million. So That's so much lower than question. every other state's projections and what we've heard from everywhere else. I, I, I don't understand it. But. May, may I ask a question? Why that um, you, sure. You keep referring to the 4.4 as the midpoint on the 14% excise tax, but you have 4.2 at the bottom. Um, yes. And tell what's the dis I know it's not a lot, but what's the discrepancy there? The discrepancy there is so the the red the red line that you see there is what I had estimated for the House bill um, in February of 2020 when the bill passed. Um, what the midpoint uh, the 4.4 .4 is is the latest estimate. I just wanted to give a sense to the committee how the estimates have changed. So it's gone up a little bit. Um, it's really confusing because what you normally would do is you look at the red figure, which is in italics as sort of your answer, um, mm. but what it is is history, right? Yes, it's history. I apologize so, for the format. So we should ignore the red figures and focus on the black figures. Yes, I would. If if you are not concerned with how the revenues the revenues have changed, then ignore the red figures completely. Perfect. Okay. And if and if I were relabeling this, I would include in the third box where it says sales tax revenue education fund. I put six percent in there just because people are looking for the fourteen and the six, but that's where the six percent figure falls, right? Yes, that is the six percent sales tax figure. Thanks. Good. So, um, yes, the combined total tax rate on the retail sale in, in the state of Vermont of the House bill would be um, would be twenty percent, fourteen percent for the excise tax, and six percent for the, the sales tax. Okay. Thank you. Now, can I do since the 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 second, third, fourth tables would be total together. 
or is it just the second and third? I mean, you've got just, this 30% of excise tax revenue. Is, 30, is that 30% of 3 million? That's 30% of the, of the second table, yeah, so. Um, but, but it says 2 million, 30% of 4 million is not 2 million. I, excuse me, 30% of 2.9 million is not 2 million. Oh, it's the 6.8 million. Good Lord, where, where are you taking the prevention fund? Is that out of the excise tax or out of the sales tax? The prevention fund comes out of the excise tax revenue. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. So that would be make it two, 6.8, 30%. Yeah, so it's, it's um, those that's are pretty, categories. That's pretty piddling. Yeah, and the bottom two tables just show the diversion of the excise tax revenue, which, because um, the excise tax revenue is the 14% figure. And so that 14% number in that second table is going to get divided 30% to the prevention fund and 70% to the general fund. So 30% of the $4.4 million in fiscal year 23 is $1.3 million um, for the prevention fund and $3.1 million for the general fund. And so uh, there, so in, in sum, the total revenue that we expect from the from 20% retail, 20% um, tax on retail sales from the house bill, if we, if we look at fiscal year 23, the midpoint would be $6.3 million for the house for 20%. Are there any questions on, the, on these? House estimates. I think they're just extremely low projections of income from everything I've seen over the years, and every I I just think that the that that you way underestimated the income. So, but I felt that way since the beginning. Understood. Well, there's a, there's a chart in the in the appendix I can I can highlight at the end after I'm done with the Senate that'll show how this compares to some, some other states. Um, okay. So um, Andrew, if you can scroll to the next page. So just briefly, so they have the note, I have some notes here at the top. So there is additional fee revenue to be, to be generated by both bills, but we don't have a sense of what that fee schedule should, is going to be from the board. And so, the fiscal note for both bills, and I think the language says the, the, the board has to establish revenues um, similar to the experience um, of Massachusetts, and um, which we sort of uh, calculated to be roughly $500,000 to $650,000 per year um, in additional revenue to the, to, the sales, to the excise and sales tax revenues here. But um, there also is in the House bill, um, there are local option fees um, that are to be set by the board, but they haven't been set. So we didn't really estimate because we have there's no, we didn't have a basis for what um, those fees would be, which uh, municipalities might take it up. And so there is the, there is the potential for additional revenue here um, on, on, for, from the local fees, but we did not estimate those. Uh, um, if I could jump in, you called those local option fees. Is that? Oh, sorry. Is that what you meant? Sorry, maybe the, I don't. I don't quite know exactly what they should, local fees. Um, maybe not local yeah. option. I, th I think local fees. I mean, they're 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 just they're fees that apply to all different stages of um, licenses. So, um, right. Okay. okay. Yeah. So they're they're not local option per se. They're just local fees. Local fees. I apologize in the tax world, <laughs> there are all the local stuff is an option. So I just, it's like the two words go together. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yes, they're just local fees. They're not really local option. Um, um, okay, so move along to the Senate version of the bill. Um, 
so again, as, as in the house part of this um, sheet, the first table is the taxable sales. The taxable sales in the Senate are slightly lower um, in fiscal year 23, the first year, because there's nothing in the Senate bill that allows for that early integrated license for the medical dispensaries. So the number um, in, in the Senate bill is, um, a little bit, is 33.8 um, million dollars in fiscal year 23, because it's essentially once the market comes online, it's, it's just straight online. There's no sort of stagger um, from the, the integrated um, licenses. And then the second table is the 16% excise tax revenues for the Senate version of the bill. Um, and the midpoint estimate for that 16% for fiscal year 23 is $4.8 million. Um, and there's, there's no sales tax applied to the, to the Senate bill. There is um, a potential 2% local option tax revenue. And so if assuming that every municipality that does look that has retail sales also has a local option tax on top, you're talking another $600,000 on top of that. Um, so in, in a sense that you can compare if we had, a, if I had a total revenue table here, you can compare um, the, the total revenue in the house bill is about $6.3 million between the 20% um, tax and the Senate would be um, uh, $4.8 million plus 600,000. So $5.4 million. So a little bit lower in the Senate. And that's largely because the, the overall tax rate on cannabis is lower in the Senate version than it is in the House. May I ask a question? Um, the, um, you mentioned that your overall sales figure is different because of the start dates, but uh, you didn't adjust for um, consumption or, or uh, sort of the, the base based on the 20% versus the 18%, am I right? No, uh, yeah. there has, the, the similarity between these tax rates is not enough for me to apply a, sort of an elasticity factor where there would be a change in consumption. Um, we, I just haven't seen the evidence from what I've read that a significantly high, or so if, if the difference between these two bills was 45 and 20, then there would be a difference, um, but not between 16% um, and 20%. Um, there's just not been the evidence that I have seen to change that, that shows that that is going to change significant behavior. And so in effect, the only thing that's changed between these two bills for the taxable sales is the timeline of the bills, not the actual underlying assumptions of the model. Yep. Okay. Thank you. And, and so like that, like I had mentioned for the house, we there is an additional five hundred to six hundred and fifty thousand dollars per year of fee revenue here. Um, that's that's not being accounted for. So um, and maybe this is Michelle, not you, but I um, when we went over the Senate bill, um, it was a sort of passing reference to fees, but it wasn't really clearly articulated. Um, I didn't expect that there was going to be this fee revenue in the Senate version of the bill, but maybe I missed something in the draft. Where, what is that fee revenue coming from in the Senate version? Uh, I don't know if that's for, for me or Michelle, but I think if I recall, the language is roughly similar for the fee, for the fee revenue for the board. Um, itself for like paying for the, the board. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. So this is the state fee money. Yes. Yes. It. I'm sorry. Yes. But not that there's no yeah. local fee here. There's no local yeah. fees in the Senate bill. I'm glad you clarified that because I was going to ask that question. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so there's six, five hundred to $650,000 worth of state fee revenue to finance the board. Um, and in the house, there's local fees that are yet to be determined that are that would be that are in addition to that. In the Senate, there are no local fees. There is the local option tax revenue. I think if we get to the point where we're preparing this for the floor, it'd probably be good to to specify that these are fees that go to the state. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I agree. I'm I just will again remark that I think this is way underestimated in income from everything that I've seen. 
So I'd like to better understand the uh, metrics behind your um, calculations here. Absolutely. And maybe the next table, uh, Andrew, can you scroll the figure of the next, the next page? We'll highlight a little bit. So I prepared this chart um, to show comparisons of other what other states have done. And so what this ch chart essentially shows is um, if we imagine what Colorado, Washington, Oregon, Massachusetts, and California, if they had the same population as Vermont, and if they had the same 14% excise tax, so this is just, the, just comparing the house, but the Senate numbers are, are quite similar. Imagine those states had the same population and same tax rate as, um, as what's being proposed in S54. This is how much revenue they would collect. Um, and the numbers for those states are based upon what they've actually collected in revenue. So what you see for Colorado, that line is actual revenues from their state, but it's just normalized because Col Colorado has a much larger population than we do. And, there's, and their tax rate is significantly higher than what we would have. And so essentially it is normalizing all the sales of other states and comparing what these estimates are. So the green range here, the bottom of it is the low and the top of it is the high. Um, and so what, what an effect this says, if you look at the red line, <coughs> is that um, if we, if our market ends up at the low range, what it'll end up looking like is Massachusetts experience. If it ends up towards the high line, it will end up more like um, Colorado's experience. So these estimates, if you normalize them by the, the population and the excise tax rate, fall uh, within, the, within the range of what other states have experienced with actual revenue. Now you'll hear from other states that they've collected significantly higher revenues. You know, Colorado collects, um, I think, north of $80 million a year in, in revenue. Um, but that's because, I mean, they, all, they have a much higher tax rate and they have a much greater population than Vermont. And so in order to compare what these estimates are like to theirs, we sort of, um, we sort of, we normalize it by population and by our and, and that tax rate. So in effect, these numbers end up being um, in the range of what other states are, are experiencing, at may least I, these states. Graham, can I ask a couple of questions? Sure. John, is it okay? Yes, absolutely, Dick. Uh, Graham, my first question, this based just on Vermont population and not on uh, tourists coming here from other states, not from New York coming here to buy because there's no uh, place in New York, New Hampshire coming here to buy because there's no place in New Hampshire. Um, we know, I know, or I don't know, I really don't know this. I've heard estimates that from uh, a local representative that they've heard that 20 to 25 percent of the sales in Williamstown, Mass are Vermont residents. Um, so the estimates that I've done do assume um, traveling travelers purchasing um, marijuana in the state, um, and it's it's roughly about ten to fifteen percent of the overall market um, is from travelers. But the the other thing to remember here is that it's difficult to to estimate the extent to which. Um, um, Travelers will be purchasing marijuana in, in in Vermont when Massachusetts, which is by by far our biggest tourism state, has legalized sales. So, um, and with a roughly similar tax rate. Um, and so, yeah, the model that I that that's built here assumes um, um, some travelers coming to Vermont and purchasing and purchasing cannabis. So, and the other thing too is. I only point out when our cigarette prices were competitive with New Hampshire, we in the south corner had had people from New York and Massachusetts coming here to buy cigarettes and alcohol. <clears throat> so while mm. well, you may be looking at Massachusetts for you, we're looking in this area, and John can attest to that, Connecticut, um, New York, and um, Part of Massachusetts in the southwestern part of the state, so I, I you know, I, I can remember back when we were competitive, the 
the number of people at our cigarette stores. Um, that's all changed. And I'm not complaining about the change. I'm just saying that that does affect revenues. Yeah, that you're absolutely right. And, and there, that, that's the, I mean, quite frankly, that's one of the, uh, the difficulties of making a, a, a tax estimate for cannabis revenues, because there's so, there's so many unknowns and every market is different. Right. And so, you know, it's very well likely that, you know, New York residents will flood across the border into, um, you know, Southern Vermont um, yep. and, and purchase a lot of, of cannabis. And well, the only thing we just, we rely as much as we can on information from other states. And um, one of the illustrations that I had that was helpful for me doing this was the, the situation of Washington and Oregon. Washington, um, I'm trying to remember, I think Oregon went first um, with their, with cannabis. Well, Washington and went first. Washington went. What, I, what, I can't remember which one went first, but they they had a cross border issue and they saw significant sales happening. Um, you know, uh, on no, either once, side. Of once Oregon went, they lost that border. Traffic. They lost that border advantage. But you know, just looking at this chart, you know, the estimates that we've come up with um, in this green range are, you know, they fall into the range. But yeah, I, can't, I don't know. I can't remember which one went first, but Washington and Oregon both fall within this range. And so, you know, we have another state with that had quite a bit of bo cross-border um, competitiveness. We had two states that have relatively high usage rates. Um, Vermont has the highest usage rate in the country, but these two states are um, are towards the top. Um, and so they're sort of an illustrative <laughs> example of, of potential border issues. Now, it is possible that um, we, we might have more than, than, than those two states had more cross-border um, effects. And it's, it is possible that the people who, because it, when you're trying to estimate cannabis revenues, that it's not just how many people, it's how much they will buy. And so um, it could be a factor that more people will come, but it could also be that they'll, they're purchasing um, significantly more cannabis than than um, the cross border experience in Washington or so. I won't rule it out, but that's why we put high and low around some of these to, to emphasize that uncertainty. John, may I ask a question? Sure, go right ahead, Jeanette. Yeah, I got a couple too. So, Graham, I I I know that this is kind of outside of what we're actually talking about because we're talking about direct um, tax revenue from these sales, but. Is there any way of estimating? So, if you look at the um, the twenty three, the midpoint, FY twenty three, the midpoint, and then you take that amount and um, reduce it by the two. Uh, I'm looking at the house version here. The there's still um, a fair amount of income that's been generated for the retailers and the growers and stuff. Is there any way of estimating the kind of revenue that might come to the state from increased income taxes on on those new jobs and stuff, or is that so far outside that we shouldn't even go there? Typically, our office doesn't do those second order um, effects okay. um, because it, it is difficult to, to estimate not just how many retail establishments we have, but you know, in a case like income taxes, how will those profits be divided? Will they go to yeah. higher income okay. people? Will they go to lower income people? But the additional thing too is that it is possible that a lot of, um, be, uh, because it's a, it's a startup market and there's a lot of upfront capital costs that the actual income that these people report might not be that, well, might not even be positive because they're investing so much at the beginning. So no. it is, it's sort of, it is difficult. And there's lots of other, other variables at play, but it, Certainly, once the market is much more mature, the, the the state can count on probably some some income taxes, and to the extent that some of these um, establishments um, use um, buildings that are um, you know in, in more disrepair or vacant, um, that might help our grand list in the future. When I spoke to um, Colorado about some of these second term second level effects. He sort of said the same thing I'm saying to you about income. They don't really know whether how much income they're getting or corporate income tax revenue. But they said the biggest thing was that a lot of the um, 
a lot of the, the growing operations and the, and the retail sales were, were taking over warehouses that had been vacant. Um, and so that had improved their grant list. Um, but that didn't happen until two, three years uh, down the line. So I think, I think you're right to point out that there could, there actually will be indirect revenues that'll come from this, but those were not estimated for, for these two. Yep, thank you. Yep. Rob, you had a question? Rob, I think you're muted. I was, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Graham, a couple questions around Colorado and Massachusetts. At the time, both of those states decided to go the retail route. Were there any bordering states that cannabis was legal in at the time, do you, would you know? Uh, I don't believe there was for Colorado. Um, mm -hmm. And then for Massachusetts, I don't think so. Um, Maine recently became um, legalized, but they, I think, just started retail sales. Um, right. So what I'm trying to get at is the cross-border sales that we would be potentially looking at for here in Vermont, wouldn't it be reasonable to think that those numbers were sort of baked into the Colorado and Massachusetts numbers already? Because a fair amount of their business or a percentage of their business came from out of state, other states? Uh, yeah, I, I think that that's a correct statement that those states probably benefited quite a bit more than, yeah, I, I can't say for sure what we're gonna benefit from cross state sales. We will certainly benefit, but to the level of Colorado, which had a first mover advantage, or in, like I said, in the event, in the situation of Washington, Oregon, um, one of those went first and early, um, they benefited significantly from cross border sales. Um, I, in my professional, judgment for working on this, I don't think we will have the same level of cross-border sales as those two were because we're, there will now, if, if this bill is passed, there will now be three New England states where there'll be a legal retail market for cannabis. Um, and so it, it just seems to, and with, with relatively similar tax rates, I should add. So it's, it's not as if you know, people are travel would travel to Vermont to get a significantly better tax rate um, on cannabis, and so. Um, yeah. Very good, thank you. May I ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, uh, Graham. Can you remind me what the tax rate in Massachusetts and Maine is? The the all in tax rate. Oh, I think Massachusetts is. Um, I think it's 10.75, but then I think there are local taxes on top of that, which drive it much closer to like 16 to 20%. I don't quite remember Maine's off the top of my head, but I can send that to the committee. Thanks. Hey, John. Yes, Joe, go ahead. Um, I think this is an appropriate place to make a comment since all of us have been accused of trying to go through this exercise of passing this tax and regulated system, we've had dollar signs in our eyes. And it is important to note that we don't really have a handle on how much is actually going to be produced as a result of this effort. But money was never, at least in my eyes, and I believe in many other people's eyes, the main reason for going through this system. As Graham pointed out, we have the highest consumption rate per capita in this country. And all of that is coming from either underground sales or now cross-border sales. And that underground sales has been the main concern. We want a place for people to be able to, pur to purchase a safe product that has to be monitored. We want to generate a revenue stream, whatever it is, for the benefit of education and prevention and law enforcement. And those are the main objectives of this project, not the number of dollars that we will see. I suspect Dick is right that these are figures that are on the low side of what may end up being generated, but it really is important that we not leave this conversation leaving anybody with the impression that we are expecting grand amounts of money to come out of this. And that's the reason we're driving this conversation. Just wanted to leave that in there. Thank you. 
Thank you. And I could just follow up on Senator An or Representative Ansel's question. Um, the sales, the tax in Maine is 10% for the uh, sales tax on marijuana, plus there are other taxes on flowers and the, the trim and the seedlings. So um, it's at least 10% plus there are taxes on the producers. Thank you. Any other questions for Graham? I just like to comment and follow up on Joe's comment. I think that um, sometimes we forget why we're doing something. And I appreciate Joe raising that because in many ways, this bill is more about consumer safety than it is about revenue. And um, I'm reminded that we have no idea what the product is people are buying unless they're buying it in another state, which has certified the product, et cetera. So, and, but also I wanted to make sure I understand that in these revenues, these are net revenue, not revenue. And then we have to pay for the administration of the program, et cetera. Am I correct, Graham? I, what you're saying is right. So these are just the revenues that we were receiving. So can you show us um, in your models, the next time we look at something like this, um, Representative Ansel would like to see the what the fees might generate, but I'd also like to see what we're um, getting to in terms of the number of people who um, are the, the cost of the administration from the, all the way through. Um, and, yeah. and maybe the you know the fees we currently get from the medic from the medical um, would be um, instructive. Uh, yes, I, we can certainly put that together. I think Stephanie Bear has put together a sheet that highlights. I don't um, think there's any plan to do away with the fees on the medical, are there, Janet? I don't know. Um, no. Can I ask a question? John? Yes, go ahead, Janet. This is just, I, I'm not sure who exactly this is for, but to, it's so that I understand completely the, the House proposal here. The, 6% sales tax that goes to early education or before school and after school programs, that isn't replacing something that already exists in the education fund, right? This is new revenue that has been um, from this uh, these sales that would go into funding a new set of programs. And then, and then at some point I would just like to hear how that decision was made as opposed to higher ed or any other decision. But this is new funding, right? Is that the way I understand this? Yes, it, it's new money to the education fund. Okay. It's not taking any money away from anything. It's not, re it's not replacing any money that currently exists in the education fund for that purpose. Um, I. I can't. I, I I can't answer that. I'm not sure about that. I um. I I know. I understand the revenue side much better than I understand the spending side. Um. So it's new revenue to the education fund. Whether there are currently uh, prevention programs that um, you know, might get folded into this effort, I'm not sure about that. Well, no. That but the prevention is different than the or before school and after school, the prevention comes out of the 14% excise tax. The early right. education I miss, the and after school programs come out of the 6%. Yeah. And uh, what I'm wondering is if we currently spend $100 on early educate, on before and after school programs, right. and now we're gonna spend 6,000 or $6, are we, reducing what we're currently spending by six dollars so we're only spending 94 or is we are we going to be spending 106 that's not addressed in the bill as far as i know well but it is important to know whether Anthea, you, you have some comment on this yes i was just going to say um section 17c in the house version which was language that i believe was added in by appropriations <laughs> says that the 6% um, goes to fund a grant program 
to start or expand after school and summer learning programs with a focus on increasing access in underserved areas of the state. So it could be going to expanding existing programs or starting new programs. But it is new revenue, it wouldn't. Okay, got it, All right, thank you. It's impossible to know within any particular school budget whether it's gonna replace any money um, and we don't really control that. Um, but the amount of money that the revenue is all new. So there will be an additional, whatever that figure is going out in grants for, um, for uh, before and after the programs. And this came from the appropriations committee. So that they were the ones that decided it should be early education instead of higher education or whatever. It was the education committee and the appropriations committee working okay. together. But it, it's the appropriations that added it. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? I wonder if we could do go to breakout rooms. I think we can if you would like to. Um, yeah, and if Andrea, um, Andrea, if uh, yes, whenever you're ready, uh, uh, Senator Pearson could be invited to our breakout room. We'd appreciate that. I think Peggy is taking care of that. Okay, <clears throat> and I. How long would you like to go for? Um. Well, it's, we would like Michelle for about 15 to 20 minutes, and I'm sure you'd like her too, John. So, are um, we talking about anything in particular, Dick, here? Like what we talked about this morning? Well, we're or, trying to, I, one thing the, we're trying to do is summarize our position on areas where we haven't already provided you with a proposal, and then coming back at you with a summary of all of our proposals and you'd be able to see where we're still apart and then go from there. So maybe if we were to all get back together at 10, 30 and give each each breakout team 20 minutes to meet with Michelle, that might be, oh, I don't know. You know, it's up to you what you wanna do. Well, uh, I, would, I would like to have Michelle for 20 minutes and then maybe we talk amongst ourselves or whatever, but. Because at this point, we don't have anything to react to. Well, actually, we've given you a whole bunch of proposals. We have. <laughs> have we seen them? When? No. We well, it's this either. process. We gave you proposal after proposal. We agreed with you. We disagreed <laughs> with you. We've actually asked you to reconsider your position on seatbelts, for example. Oh. Um, Dick, I have and, an excellent so, memory. It's just really short. Well... <laughs> then we will get it down on paper for you so you can react to all the proposals. I mean, we've given so much, I'm not sure there's anything left to give. I know, but Christmas is coming early this year for us, obviously. Obviously. But I, I, I'm seriously, we, we yeah. have made a number of chain, you know, said Senate's okay with this, okay with that, but I don't know if we've ever if we've ever put it down on paper, what we're agreeing to and what we're not agreeing to at this point. Right. Because you're right, but that yeah. would help me. John? Yes. And then you'd ahead, be John. able to see how much we've given Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Jeanette, go ahead. So I would suggest that we, if we're going to um, get together individually and whether the house has anything to talk to each other about at this point is up to them, but we do and we can have Michelle, but we would, there is no way Michelle would be able to get everything together by 1030 to present. So I would suggest that we do it and then we take a break so that Michelle can prepare what we have and get it in writing. And, and then we come back together like maybe at 11 or 1115 to give her time. Michelle? I would just, um, I actually do have she almost has everything. Dump. I have almost everything written. There's oh, just a couple okay. things they want to chat with me about after this conversation. And I and Andrea, if it's okay, if you can loop Anthea in too with the Senate, and then um, I, you know, I think it's fine for. I think you guys can have a written proposal at 10:30 to review, and I can walk you through. And then the House can maybe break out and respond and and talk privately about that. Does okay, thank you. I didn't know you were that far. I should never have doubted you. You underestimated her. Janet, 
Well, um, I'm unless there's something going on that I don't know about, I, I, it seems to me that we don't have much to discuss until we see what you are, have put in writing. I mean, we can chat. Yeah, I would agree with Janet. It would be nice to, have, as Michelle said, to have a written document to look at to understand your position. Yes, as a house conference. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know how to organize the timing of that, but. Um, so, can I, how can I ask one technical question while I've got all of us still here? Sure. It has to do with current use and your expectation of a cultivator. Would the cultivator be under current use or not? The, the, um, if they were currently a small producer, but, say, um, would they be under current use or not? Do you know? The, the land that's in cultivation isn't farming for the purpose of current use. They may, they may have land in current use, but the, the um, at least so, that's my understanding. Anthea, I don't know if you want to weigh in. A thousand on that. acres wouldn't be current use. That would be regular that's my understanding that's also my understanding okay yeah i mean there, there are farmers who are have other farm crops so they're they may be in current use for those purposes but whatever if they pull out some acreage for cultivation of cannabis that land wouldn't be eligible for current use okay all right so we're gonna break until 10 30 at the earliest, is that my understanding? Sounds good. And at that point, there'll be a document that the house conferees can look at. Yeah, yes, and I Andrea, thought you I were will... keeping track of all the things we gave. Well, we, we, we do, but we want to make sure we get everything correct. Okay, there. cool. I was doing it on a napkin, Dick, and I still had space left over. Oh, no. I hope you use both sides. <laughs> ah. All right. We'll, so we'll see you all back here at 1030. We'll, Everybody will be back here at 1030. Yeah, we'll go, the house will go into breakout and just have a brief discussion. Immediately or at 1030? Right now. Immediately. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Immediately. See you all at 1030. Am I looking at the wrong form here? Because I got the potential timeline for S54. Is that what we're looking at? No, there's a, there's two documents. One is oh. the proposal and the oh, second. Okay timeline the timeline i'm not going to discuss now i'm going to focus Sorry. on just the proposal the timeline yep. i wanted to start giving people an idea of what kind of dates we'd be looking at if you started to combine these things and also because the last version was passed in march and we were looking at a june effective date yep. and now we're down the road so everything's got to change so i just wanted to start working with a timeline so people could start thinking about those things because it does affect things like the board reporting back on fees and things like that because they won't get going um, for a while. Yep, thank you. Okay, we, we have the document up now. Right. Okay. So everybody ready? Yep. yep. Yes. Okay. So we're taking a look at, this is the proposal um, from the Senate. And I'm sorry, I should have written that up at the top there. Um, so on the first, with regard to the regulatory authority, the Senate agrees to the House proposal of amendment provided that the members that the governor selects for the board are, uh, are confirmed by the Senate. Okay. Got it. Uh, the next one on the 12 member advisory committee um, that was not in the Senate version and the Senate agrees to the House proposal of the inclusion of the advisory committee. Next, you both had an auditor report in your versions, but the House proposed the board sunsetting uh, the July 1st after receiving the auditor's report, and the Senate agrees with the House proposal of amendment. The next is that, as you know, the Senate version has the medical program moving over from the Department of Public Safety to the Cannabis Control Board at some point. Um, the uh, House version does not address the medical program and the Senate does not agree with that House proposal. They would like the uh, medical program to move over to the board. Okay. 
Next on page two on appropriation, um, you're pretty similar there um, with just a little bit of adjustment and the Senate agrees to the House proposal of amendment with whatever um, tweaks have to be made for the delayed effective date, considering we're a few months down the road. On appeals, the Senate agrees with the House proposal. On licenses, the, uh, the House added a sixth type of license, which are integrated licenses, which would be, would be available just to those existing dispensaries, and the Senate agrees to the House proposal there. With regard to developing tiers for uh, licensees, uh, both versions had developing tiers for cultivators. The House added adding it for retailers as well, and the Senate agrees to the House proposal. Moving on to page three, um, the Senate uh, put in as a priority in licensing um, for Vermonters. Uh, the House took that out, but they put in something where you have the Agency of Commerce working with ag, uh, providing business and technical assistance to Vermonters, and the Senate agrees to the House proposal. Next, you have um, qualifications, uh, specifically around business type of organization, what needs to be filed in an operating plan, things like that. And the Senate agrees to the House proposal. You'll see top of page four, additional oversight requirements. The Senate agrees to the House proposal. Requirements for banking and financial transactions. The Senate agrees to the House proposal. Um, so now we're going to skip down to page five in public records. The Senate agrees to the House proposal. And sorry if some of the lines are a little wonky. We were trying to work kind of quickly there in our breakout. That's um, okay. So at the bottom of page five, uh, is the racial and social equity provisions. Um, a lot of these are the same, um, but where there were differences, the Senate agrees to the House proposal. You'll see um, though at the end of that section, which is on page seven, there's one point where um, they didn't agree and that just has to do with the Senate, the House proposal doesn't address the medical program at all. And in the Senate proposal, because they did move the, the medical program over to the board, they were looking at all of that. So they wanted to have consistency on the criminal background checks between the adult use and the medical program for dispensaries. So they wanted those to be consistent in terms of background checks. Um, and then you'll see at the bottom of page seven in blue there, um, a note that the Senate wanted to raise the issue of cannabis expungement that passed May um, I? in S-294. Go ahead, Dick. Um, S-294, the Senate passed a major expungement bill. Um, unfortunately, it got over to the House and COVID hit and the House Judiciary Committee was not able to take it up. At that time, I've been in conversations with Representative Grad about perhaps moving the cannabis expungement issues to another bill. Um, She's in a, we are in agreement that um, given all the uh, emails we've received about social equity and racial justice, that um, this proposal, which decriminalizes um, the possession of marijuana um, from between two and one ounces, it um, then ex automatically expunges all marijuana convictions for possession of under two ounces of marijuana. You may remember in the past, before we um, passed marijuana legalization, the possession of one ounce or two ounce didn't matter. It was still a misdemeanor as long as it was under two ounces. And so in many cases, there were no tests to determine whether the person had an ounce and a half or one ounce or whatever. So that's the reason for that. And we feel that by, um, <clears throat> Expunging that is an important step in many of those racial justice emails that we've all received uh, about why not do S54 um, and that you should should wait until you've got the racial equities back. Uh, 
we think that with the with many of the additions that the house made and with this addition um we've addressed some of those concerns so um we're, it's not a part of our conference committee and I'm not proposing it be part of this bill, but I wanted to raise that so the public's aware of that and that uh, we are working with the House, this House Judiciary uh, on this issue. Okay, so, so just to be clear, Dick, you're not proposing to add S-94 to- um, No, no, we're not. At, we're not proposing to add it, we're asking that uh, this committee be aware of that and that um, as we look, um, as we get emails from people and I, I want to make clear, we're not adding it, we're not proposing to add it to this bill, but I hope you will join us and encourage in supporting Representative Grad and trying to move that forward. Okay, got it. Okay, I'm on page eight on local control uh, on the issue of opt in, opt out. The Senate does not agree to the House proposal and would like to stay with the Senate um, version of the bill. Next, under local control, with regard to the uh, local permits or licenses that are issued by the municipality. So this is not talking about the board collected fees for licenses that and money that would go back to the towns. So this is kind of the little language that was in both bills with some small differences around um, the local folks maybe, you know, requiring someone who's a licensee to get, have a zoning permit or things like that. And so the Senate agrees to the House proposal of amendment. John Murphy. On the next one, on the issue of um, the board collecting and charging local fees and that would then go back to the towns, um, the Senate does not agree to the House proposal. Next on page nine on advertising, um, the Senate proposes uh, going with the version of advertising that was voted out of House government operations that was sent to the floor. Um, so as you know, there was a floor amendment that passed in the House that um, banned all advertising, but there was um, quite a lot of language, uh, substantive language that was in there that came out of GovOps and that the Senate would agree to that, but not to the ban. Next at the bottom of page nine on prohibited products, um, on the listed prohibited products, the Senate does not agree to the House proposal. Um, they do not agree to the shift from 100 milligrams to 50 milligrams per package or the shift from 10 milligrams to five milligrams per serving. With so, regard, excuse me, could um, Dick, could you explain that for me? Why you disagree with that? It's, uh, we want to continue to discuss the prohibited products. Oh, okay, you want to continue to discuss? Yep. Um, okay. I don't, I, it's not a, it's more of a, I think there's some of what we're all, we're all talking about the same thing in many ways. Um, and uh, we, we think it needs more discussion about what it exactly is our goal here, which I think is to keep, keep these prohibited products away from kids and how much that you put in, et cetera. So we just think it needs more, more discussion. Okay. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're, I think all agreed that we wanna keep these products safe and consumer safety is an important factor. So towards the bottom of page 10, uh, so with respect to labeling, um, the Senate agrees with the House proposal of amendment um, provided that when the health warning, so the House has health warnings being developed by the Department of Health and adopted via rule by the board, and the Senate is proposing that the health warnings are developed by the board in consultation with the Department of Health and then adopted by rule. Okay. Page 11, small cultivators. There's a few things there. The Senate is agreeing to all of the House's proposals. 
got cultivation. That. I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure they got the Senate agreed to all of that. Yep. Yep. Okay. So bottom page 11 on cultivation <laughs> with regard to pesticides, um, uh, the Senate agrees to the House proposal. Um, and then coming down to the issue about whether or not cannabis cultivation is going to be regulated as farming or not, um, the Senate would like to have to take some more time to discuss the issue um, with the con with the conferees and outside. And outside. Uh, well, out with the conferees and then amongst themselves with others trying to understand the implications of it. So I don't let know. Me, let me just <clears throat> work. Some of us are concerned. Obviously, if you make it a farming issue, you take away the right to zone and the, the rights of municipalities in dealing with, with the product. But at the same time, a small cultivator who wants to do a small amount and may be currently in current use or may wish to take advantage of current use would be forced out of that program. Uh, so there's a lot of little side issues I think need discussion. It's not necessarily uh, whether or not it should be create, classified as farming. Because again, there, you know, there's differences. And then if you get the big cultivators or big users, then you've got other uh, problems. So we just think we would like more discussion on the farming issue. Um, does that make sense? Yes, it does. So moving on to retail on page 13, the Senate agrees with the House proposal. Bottom of the page on employee training, Senate agrees with the House proposal. Page 14, the excise tax. Uh, the Senate is proposing a 14% cannabis excise tax um, on anything that's sold at a retail or retailer or integrated licensee, provided that 2% is de designated for municipalities that have a licensed cannabis establishment. And that money would be sent to those towns based on a formula that takes into account the number and type of licensees in that town and the impact on that town. Okay, and so would that be done through rulemaking um, or who would make that determination of how that money would be distributed? The, the board would make a recommendation to the, to the legislature. Okay, got it. Yep. So next on the 30% uh, in the, so in the, you'll recall that in the Senate version, all the monies, all the excise tax went into the general fund. In the House version, 30% uh, would be dedicated to substance abuse misuse prevention programming as recommended by the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council. With the remaining monies going to the general fund, the Senate um, is okay with 30% um, going to uh, um, be used for substance misuse prevention programming, provided that there is a $10 million cap. And also that it is, uh, that that money goes to general fund and is earmarked for the prevention, um, but not necessarily designated specifically to, that must be spent as required, as recommended by the oversight and advisory council. So it would be up to the legislature to make that determination. They could take into consideration recommendations from the Oversight and Advisory Council, but it would ultimately be up to the legislature to make the determination about how to use that substance misuse funding. Next okay. page, page 15 on the sales tax. Um, no sales tax in the Senate version. There was a 6% on the House proposal um, that would be used for, um, for grants for after school and summer <laughs> learning programs. And the Senate agrees with the House proposal. Next on there, local option. Um, that is now, there's their proposal is that there would be no local option, they had a 2%, you guys, uh, the House took it out. Um, the Senate is proposing to address it through the 2% of the 14% in the excise tax rather than it being a separate local option tax. 
So board reporting requirements, um, you'll see there at the bottom of page 15, Senate agrees with the House proposal, provided that the board also recommends fees for the medical program. So again, they want the medical to be moving over to the board. So there's agreement all there. If you move to page 18, um, they do not agree, as we already discussed, uh, local fees to be charged by the board, um, of which monies would then be sent back to the towns. So instead of the, the local fees being collected, there'd be the 2% that then is distributed back to the towns according to a formula. So other board reporting requirements, the Senate agrees to the House proposal of amendment. May I ask a question about the local fees? Um, is the, the end result of the Senate's position here that um, municipalities would be prohibited from charging fees? Jeanette. No. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeanette. Did you want to answer, Jeanette? Jeanette, you no. want to answer? Municipalities are already allowed to charge fees, like zoning permit fees. Um, they charge, they get $100 back for licenses for liquor um, establishments. They can charge um, business annual um, personal property um, fees. So they would still be allowed to charge those fees. We're, they aren't being prohibited from charging things that they already are allowed to charge. But this proposal would have set up the board to decide what fees and what how much they were and actually the legislature on the, yeah on the local yeah it, it wouldn't have been the board it would have been the full legislature but it, it would have been decided right as well. right yeah. yeah um okay so the other board reporting requirements um as i mentioned the senate agrees with the house proposal of amendment Page 19, uh, they agree, the Senate agrees to the House proposal of amendment with regard to the reporting back of, of environmental and energy issues, provided that syncs with whatever's determined, whatever y'all land on with regard to the farming issue. Top of page 20, um, is that's the energy, um, which they agree to. Bottom of page 20, uh, there's the House proposal around um, whether that having the board report back to the legislature about whether or not um, certain cannabis establishment licensees should be regulated as a food manufacturing establishment or a food processor uh, according to current law. And the Senate agrees to the House proposal of amendment. Moving on to existing medical dispensaries, we already talked about the Senate does not agree with the House proposal of leaving uh, the medical program in the Department of Public Safety. Page 22, the House does agree to the House proposal of amendment with regard to adding a, an integrated license in the adult use market for dispensaries. And it agrees with the uh, priority licensing for the integrated licensees, small cultivators and testing labs. Page 23, moving on to highway safety. Uh, the Senate agrees to the house proposal with regard to the required 16 hours of A-RIDE training. The Senate does not agree to the provisions in the House proposal of amendment that pertain to saliva testing. <clears throat> the Senate does agree to the House proposal with regard to the codification of the presumptive admissibility of field sobriety tests and DREs. There's, there, there's one provision at the bottom of page 23 that was in the House version um, that and this actually passed in the t-bill and so it are we don't need it any longer because it's already current law so um 
Dick, could you explain the Senate's position on saliva testing? We, we oppose adding saliva. Um, we, we've long held that um, the saliva, that saliva is not accurate. There is no um, value to it. Um, we have seen that um, state, some states have gone and set an arbitrary limit, but it doesn't show impairment. Um, it only shows that there is some sense that it's there. And so at this point, um, given that the Senate has opposed saliva and opposes seatbelts, <clears throat> we don't know where to turn in terms of the public safety issues that the House has presented other than to um, give to you um, these other provisions within the public safety realm, but that maintaining that saliva um, would be a tough sell for us on the Senate floor and that seatbelts is an impossible sell for us on a Senate floor. We leave those two items open. Okay. So top of page 24, um, Senate agrees to the House proposal uh, with regard to somebody has to make arrangements for their own independent chemical, chemical analysis and they agree to it for an evidentiary sample of blood but not for saliva because they're not agreeing to saliva. With regard to the DPS report, the Senate agrees to the House proposal of amendment um, with regard to the identifying a threshold level of THC in a person's bloodstream uh, and the report to the General Assembly from DPS, the Senate agrees to the House proposal there. Uh, as Senator Sears just mentioned, um, the Senate does not agree to primary enforcement of seatbelts. Um, they do agree to the last but with regard to the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council reports to the General Assembly. And that's it. So, uh, I appreciate, Michelle, all that work in putting together our proposal. And if you would, you know, look at it, um, what we have done is, uh, given in many areas we've agreed with the house um, i think there's about eight areas we're still apart i won't um insult anybody by suggesting that they're not major issues but um we are actually much closer than many would believe so um we could get this done uh, but we need some Reevaluation by the other by the House as to where you're at on these issues where we're remain far apart, or actually in some of them we're not far apart. <clears throat> we need to just have conversations about prohibited um, products. I think we're actually fairly close. Um, all of us uh, uh, want to make sure that minors as well as uh, consumers are protected with whatever we do here. Um, I appreciate um, the Senate's work here and um, agreeing to many of the House positions. Um, and I, I thank you for that. Um, and, and I do think we, we have covered a lot of ground um, and reached agreement on, on many things. And there are some issues we still need to have discussion on. And then there are some issues where we obviously disagree. Mm -hmm. um, but um, Janet or Rob, do you have any questions for the Senate? I don't have questions. I don't know whether it would be helpful for the House conferees to get together for a few minutes. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I just want to make sure um, if we had any questions about the Senate positions that we try to get them answered. Rob, are you okay? I am okay. Is there an expectation you think that we're going to get back together as a group? Today. Yeah, what, what I think we should do is, is take a um, 20 minute break out um, um, so the House can discuss the, the Senate proposal um, and then get back to the Senate um, with respect to our thoughts.
That's perfect because my computer's running out of power and I got to get powered up. Okay. <laughs> Battery's running out of power, I should say. So that, if the Senate wants to do a breakout to, um, and just chat, I'm assuming yeah. you'd like Michelle with you. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, Peggy, if you could put us in a breakout room um, and then uh, Joe, Jeanette, and I can chat with you and uh, talk about the weather or whatever. Actually, I think Andrea needs to do it, yeah. but she'll do it. All right. Um, Andrea and I will I wasn't start. sure. I don't know. So we now have to yep. mute and then you stop the video. Stop video. Yes. Thank you. I first of all want to thank the Senate um, for putting together this proposal. Um, we just discussed it. And while we have made progress in some areas, there are some areas that are deeply important to the House um, where we're still in disagreement. Um, one of our top priorities is protecting consumers, uh, not only for the use of cannabis through THC limits and other things, but making sure that our highways are safe. Uh, which includes making sure we don't have impaired drivers on the roads um, and uh, that people are wearing seatbelts, that the public safety issues are critically important um, to the house. Uh, with respect to local control, we, we believe the house proposal there will lead to a more holistic um, regulation system um, where you don't have regulation varying from town to town. Um, so we, we discussed that. Um, also with respect to the taxes, um, you know, we're, one question we had for you is the 2% um, that would go to local um, uses, would that be um, out of the total 14% tax um, or out of the 14% after 30% was taken out for um, substance abuse funding? After the total 14. It would be the total 14. It's another, it's another, um, we, we actually, Senator Sears, may I speak yes, to this? Yes, please. Okay. We um, originally didn't want any set asides in our bill at all for and just leave it up to the appropriations committee. But since um, you proposed setting aside 30% already for um, prevention and we went along with that, we then proposed doing 2% of the total 14, not after the 30% is taken out. It's another set aside. So now we've set aside 32% Janet? Can I get clarification though? 30% um, is 30% is of the revenue that comes in. The 2% that you're talking about are two basis points on the, on the uh, sales, basically. It's, it's like a, it's not 2% of the 14, I don't, maybe I yes. misunderstood. It's not 2% of the 14%. Yes, it, it is. 2% of the 14. Isn't the way yeah. I understand, the way I understand this is there would be a 14% excise tax out of that, 30% would go to prevention and 2% to, where does that, the 30% come out of that? That would be a tiny amount of money, the 2% of the 14. Um, oh. Graham, are you, are you here? Can no. you explain that, what I'm asking better than I just did? I think you're talking about, I thought anyway, that of the 14% that was raised in the excise tax, two basis points, two, per, two percentage of that, which is, yeah. I don't know, can't do the math quickly enough, but it's um, what, 14% of the total, something like that, 12% of the total. Can I yeah. ask a question then right. for Graham? I thought that 14% is what the state was raising. That's not leaving the 6% aside. Yeah, putting if, that the aside. Total if the total sales were, for example, were 31.4 in the mid FY23, that means that the state is tax is generating 4.4 million for itself from the 14 percent um, tax. Of that 4.4 percent, two percent of that will go to the towns. That's a teeny amount of money. Well, 
for for uh two percent of well how much is it well it's, it's like it's like a hundred thousand dollars you can explain what i'm asking better it's, it's about a hundred thousand dollars yeah but oh, okay. how would how okay. would they um generate more i had understood it differently so what i had understood is of the 14, i think so too actually i heard you heard what i'm thinking I, I guess I didn't understand what you were thinking. We had a 14% excess. Yeah. Of that 14%, 2% of the 14%. Two, two basis points. Two, right, well, two basis points. I don't points. understand basis points. That's why Graham is going to explain it. OK. <laughs> so I think that there's, there's, a, comp, there's a, a, I guess, confusion. So the, what, the one way I think Senator White is understanding it is that the 14% excise tax would raise $4.4 .4 million in FY23. Of yeah. that, 2% would be dedicated to the local. That's one way of understanding okay. it. I don't think that's what Representative Ansel is saying. What yeah, I think- That's, that's not what I had understood. I'm, I'm, that would be hard to argue with, but it's a tiny amount of money. Well, so, okay. Yeah, and the, the amount of money that would go to the local option under what Senator White, or the local funds under what Senator White is saying, is about $100,000 in fiscal right. 23. Yeah. What Senator Ansel is asking is, <laughs> is it is it two? So there's 14 percent. Is it essentially like 12? If I'm understanding what you're saying, Representative, is it like 12 percent excise and then two percent local option? That that's what I had understood. Yes. And that's yes. about yeah. six hundred thousand rather than one hundred. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's that's the way I was figuring. It, but okay. The, the okay. big it's a big difference, and depending on which way you do it. Uh, it affects the 30% that goes to um, the prevention programs. Because if you just take in 100,000 out, it doesn't have much effect on the 30%. If you take in 600,000 out, it starts to. Whichever generates more for the local municipalities is the way we want it. Yes, thank you for picking that up. I was going to agree with the two percent of the. <laughs> I understand you would have. Well, actually, I like the fees better. But anyway, sorry, Shonda jumped in. So no, no, that was that was helpful because I know mean, we we're having some trouble understanding the Senate's position with respect to the excise tax. Now I think we have a better understanding of it. Um, I think, you know, John, yes. Can I just ask a question then, and maybe this isn't the appropriate time, but. I, I would like to understand more about what you're talking about with the fees. If you think the fees are going to generate much more revenue, okay. I'd like, oh, okay. I think they generate about the same. I, I'm, I, the 600,000 um, is the figure that is what the 2% would generate. Um, I think that's right. And I think the fees are roughly in that neighborhood. It's a really a question of- local, how, fees, local fees would generate 600,000? They're not set yet, um, so until they get set, it's hard to know. Um, could could you um, just, I guess for my own edification, I need to have some understanding sure. of what that means and how they are going to get set okay. and how local fees could generate $600,000 um, without having a huge impact on the people who are the establishment owners. I mean, I... 600 anyway so if i if you could just help me understand that at some yep. point yep yep i don't know if, if anybody wants to weigh in on it now but i'm happy to do something okay. to come back thank you yeah yep so so clearly we need to have more discussion around taxes i mean there's there's no doubt about that um we you know i've already mentioned local control opt-in versus opt-out um and so and the public safety issues. Um, so what we would propose at this point is um, coming back with a counter proposal on next Monday from the House um, okay. with respect um, to the issues that remain um, in disagreement between us. I just wanna make clear that I don't see us far apart on prohibited products. If there's any okay. disagreement, we're just trying to work out details of amounts that you see being in and out, and that was uh, so. We're not we're not saying that we don't want to protect consumers. Um, we we're fine with protecting consumers. That's our 
you know, our goal is that one of the reasons, as Senator Benning pointed out, to even do this bill is to provide a regulated product that we're all comfortable with. I kind of liken the current system to moonshine whiskey. We don't know what we're getting. And uh, I wasn't alive during prohibition, I want to point out. But um, I've heard stories from my parents about it. And so I, I, I think that's, it's only the details of the prohibited products. I think we can come up very quickly through discussion on a prohibited product proposal. So we look forward to your proposal. So yep. That, yep. that I want to make clear. Secondly, uh, roadside safety is a key issue for the Senate. That's, um, we didn't put it in the bill, but we've been working on it for years. And uh, we believe uh, that's why we agreed with you a ride and so many other things we agree that it's important we just don't believe that saliva is at a point yet where it can be taken um and used as evidentiary evidence because it doesn't tell us if the driver was impaired or not that's our problem with saliva it's not that we're against um we're against using a test that might be done and then on seatbelts, it's simply a, you know, you can look at, I'm not going to argue with you about it. It's just, I know, even if the three of us on the Senate panel were to agree to uh, keep seatbelts in, we'd get defeated on the Senate floor with our proposal. And none of the three of us are ready to support seatbelts. That's just, I want to make clear. That's, it's, it's uh, just, can, can I just, conference committee. yeah. Can I just throw one other thing in saliva tests? As a criminal defense attorney, I have to tell juries all the time that a defendant is innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The saliva test as it's designed here comes in without any kind of triggering mechanism to indicate that there's intoxication. We just haven't reached consensus on that issue. So what you're actually doing is you are placing into the mix a procedure that shifts the burden of proof over to the defendant to say, well, yeah, I had THC in my system because I consumed two weeks ago. That is something that's very problematic when you are trying to deal with a criminal process that assumes a person is innocent because you've shifted that burden now over to the defendant to demonstrate it's not what it seems, folks. So from my perspective, personally, that's one of my pet peeves with that issue. Can I add something here? And then I have to run because my Xfinity guy is here and I have sure to go off. So I'm gonna add two thoughts here. One is that even all of your safety, highway safety things are related somehow to cannabis itself except for the seatbelts. That is not related at all to cannabis. It would have been very similar if we'd put in bicycle riders have to wear helmets. Um, it's not related to cannabis. And the sec my second thought is, if you could help me understand how the opt-in, out-opt, opt-in, out, opt-out option, <laughs> um, um, how one would have regulations varying from town to town and the other one wouldn't because either one, you mentioned that you did not want to see regulations varying from town to town and either one would. So to just said that and then I'll see you on Monday, but I have to so, run. Uh, I think one I, of the big, big distinctions I, between yeah, opt-in and opt-out <laughs> is the fact that with opt-in, um, you know, you can have, you're not addressing the illicit market. And that's an important feature of this. I mean, we have two things, public safety and making sure that we get the illicit market to get regulated. Yeah. I, I have to run because the guy is here to- No, I know. So if, when we, we can get explain back it in more detail Monday, later. Can tell me, okay? Well, All right. All right. Um, bye. wanted to, uh, the issue of the medical, um, remaining with DPS. I we've heard that DPS is not doesn't would like to get rid of the medical program and shift it somewhere. So if there's an alternative to DPS, um, we're all, we're happy to look at that. 
think we're right and i think that's that. an issue that we can discuss um, yeah. um i just tried to meeting with you on hmm? on the 31st yes that's is it the 31st yes yeah. it is next oh, monday God. then we all Time fly. summer's over almost but what I wanted to make sure that you understood what our top priorities are. Um, I think we've known that. Um, yeah, I understand that. And actually, I don't think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think we're all in agreement on what the top priorities are. We've we've come down to six or seven issues that are outstanding. Right. Um, whether we can bridge those issues or not. Um, we'll find out next Monday. That's right. And that's what we'll try to work on to give and, you a proposal uh, you can think about. In the meantime, um, enjoy the week. Um, I don't know if I really want to be inside all day next week, this week, in Zoom sessions. <laughs> but we'll see. I'll see Janet in a little while, I guess. I want to remind you that you're actually outside in a Zoom session. You got a pretty good <laughs> office right there, dude. I haven't, figured out, I haven't figured out how to get into the pool and stay on Zoom <laughs> and for an, a, a meeting. I am inside. <laughs> I know. No. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, John. And thanks, Janet and Bob. I'll see you in a bit. Bob, thanks. Bob. See you next week. See you all. And Joe.